How's everybody? Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> come on, how is everybody? Are we having a good conference? Yeah? Good, well, we've got an excellent panel today. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the things you guys are doing wrong with your business and some of the things you guys are doing right and how to get investment. So who wants to learn about that? Oh, come on, you guys. I mean, we gotta have a little more audience here. It's dead, it's, it's noon almost. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, um, and I'm going to say, uh, you know, a little bit about yourselves, what you guys look for, check sizes, etc. So first, we'll start off with John, and uh, then we'll move to Ashley. Hey, everyone. So uh, my name is John Copeland. I'm the managing director of Cisco Investments in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Russia. Uh, we are a corporate venture capital firm, so we are within Cisco's larger structure, and so we're really focused on the enterprise. Um, and so obviously SaaS is, is, a, is a big part of that. Uh, but uh, we, we look at very specific uh, domains within the enterprise space, so big data, cloud, data center and storage, IoT, security, autonomous, and enterprise consumer. Uh, we're usually, in Europe these days, we're really focused on series A and B. Uh, so check sizes are probably about one to five million, one to three a day, uh, two to five at B. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very interested in, in meeting great companies here this week. Cool, excellent, Ashley. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Carroll. I'm an investment partner at Social Capital. Uh, we're a for-profit venture capital firm based um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we also have offices in New York and London. Um, we invest across a variety of sectors, but we are very active SaaS investors. Um, some of our portfolio companies include Box, Yammer, Slack, Greenhouse, Intercom, um, and others like that. And we are mostly active at the Seed, Series A, and a little bit Series B. Um, and I also, prior to being an investor, um, worked in product management at a, a number of SaaS companies, including SurveyMonkey, Optimizely, and DocuSign, and went through the fundraising process from the other side of the table several times, so I know what many of you have gone through and are going through, and really excited to have a good discussion. Excellent. Well, uh, let's get it started off. I, first, I'm going to start off with Ashley. Since you've been, in, you've been in the weeds, are we all in the weeds right now? Ha, ah, I got a ha out there. <laughs> totally means yes. Um, since you've been in the weeds, how do I know if my product is an actual product or if it's just a service or like it's a real company or not? When do I know? Yeah. So I think early on when you're starting, uh, starting out your company and thinking about the scope of your product, it's really important to think about market size and sort of I, everyone probably knows this, but from the earliest stages of investment, it's mostly about team and market, and then kind of more about product, and then more in the growth round, it's mostly about me metrics and traction. So in the beginning, I see a lot of companies really um, box themselves into a corner with respect to market size because they're building um, what is really more of a feature or a tool versus a product or a solution. So really think about like if you're trying to solve this pain point that you've had um, in H, you know, HR function or sales function or something like that, it's, it's great to start small and to limit the scope, but make sure that um, you can think of, you know, how are companies going to eventually pay tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or whatever currency um, for this product or solution. So uh, this one's for you, John. When, sure. when, uh, when we're getting started, we actually have a real product what are startup founders doing wrong that's really inhibiting them from actually getting investment? Yeah, so I, I, I guess, you know, there's lots of different, uh, in SaaS in particular, there's a lot of things that uh, folks could be doing better. Um, I think, you know, what, what Ashley was saying is mostly about getting traction. So yeah. for us, you know, we are, we are really focused on, let's say from series A and up, we want to see some clear element of traction. I think that, uh, you know, startup founders have to focus on on showing traction, and in particular, by the time they're starting to raise maybe a Series A or Series B, focusing on uh, showing revenue as well as users, right? So there's a lot of, um, and the, there's a lot of folks in SaaS that are, I, I think, that are focused on growing 
users, but free users. Yeah. And I think it's really important to show that somebody's willing to pay for the service yep. in SaaS in order to get investment. Just having users is great, and it shows that there's engagement by the community. It shows that there's, uh, and it's a great product that people like to use. Um, but in the longer term, we, we'd like to see how they can convert that over to, to pay. Yeah, so when do I raise? How much and from who? Yeah. Um, so in general, as, as late as possible is ideal for you and other what does that mean? employees and common stockholders. Coming from an investor, all, yeah. all investors are like, <laughs> mm, like, when? When is? I think in the beginning, to the extent that you can bootstrap and test things offline or not as automated as they eventually will be is, is a great way to go. Um, and then a, start out small. Um, you know, if you have an idea and you go out and you try to, ra try to raise like $10 million or euros, um, if you're successful, you're going to suffer a lot of dilution. And so I would say start off with a smaller friends and family round. Um, in terms of the amount of t runway to give yourself, I'm a big fan of like nine to 12 months, I think. You know, if you only give yourself three months, you're going to be a little under the gun and it's going to be too high pressure of a situation. Um, beyond a year, maybe not enough fire under your butt. Um, so I, I'd say nine to 12 months of runway before you raise the next round. And from who? Who should I focus on? If I'm in the audience, I have a, I have a cool product, we're getting traction, who, what investor should I focus on? Should I come directly to you? Obviously, if you're doing very well, yes. But who should I focus on? Everyone should come directly to me. Yes. <laughs> um, so do some research and find, make sure that investors, so first of all, obviously, warm introductions are best. Um, do some research and find out what that investor invests in in terms of sector and stage and even within the sector. You know, even within SaaS, is it more... Um, data infrastructure security, or is it more application layer stuff? Um, and then stage is important too. So, you know, if you're raising a, a little baby pre seed round and you go talk to a growth stage investor, um, you know, they might take the meeting because they want to see what's going on, but it's not going to be a great use of your time. And so, focusing on um, that person that can help you get to the next level. And so there's a lot of great seed investors out there. Um, look at their track record, what percentage of their companies go on to raise a Series A. If you're raising a Series A, what percentage of their companies go on to raise a B and C. Um, that should give you a good indication of your likelihood for success. Now, you were telling me something earlier today. When you invest in companies, you like looking at more of the details, uh, which I find very interesting because a lot of investors don't do that. Can you tell me a little bit about that philosophy and how a lot of more investors are migrating towards that? Yeah, so um, John spoke a little bit earlier about um, uh, revenue versus engagement. Um, so th th it's sort of different if you're a self-serve SaaS tool selling into SMBs. It's, you know, they're paying for it via credit card. It's a monthly recurring thing, um, more prosumer. They tend to be freemium businesses and then all the way up to the large enterprise companies. And what I've seen is especially as you move up toward large enterprise where you have salespeople involved, um, there is a little too much emphasis on revenue. And I mean, even companies that I've advised or have invested in, I see them, they know the revenue numbers, they know the pipeline numbers inside and out. But then when I ask them, okay, that's great, someone signed on to pay you, a significant amount of money on this like annual or even multi-year contract, how are they using the product or how frequently are they using the product, and they don't know. And so really instrumenting your product, like when you release a feature in addition to the feature working, it's important to have the instrumentation to track um, the analytics around who's using it and how much to get a sense for how much value there is. So, so we look at engagement data um, and, and we actually tend to ask companies about that first even before revenue. And we've even back tested this with some of our investments um, that we did years ago prior to sort of looking at engagement metrics. And, you know, there were a couple not so great investments in there. Um, and it turns out, you know, the revenue trends looked great up and to the right, growing really quickly. But then when you looked at the engagement trends, sure enough, 10, 11 months prior to us making the investment, you could see that they were just um, selling but not doing enough building. Um, so we're really big fans of looking into like actually what's going on under the hood and how the end users are using the product. Yeah, it's interesting to notice that, uh, 
I, I love that approach, actually paying attention to revenue, because we should all be, t uh, there's so many companies out there that just focus around growth, 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 but never upon revenue. There will come a point in every startup's existence where if you're not focused on revenue, and I, I usually say even bottom line revenue, um, like profit, AKA, uh, that you're gonna go out of business or not find enough money or eventually have something happen to your startup that you don't want to have happen. So very, very important. John, what are some red flags that you see? Uh, red flags, let's see. Um, too much churn. Yep. Uh, I would say... Would you uh, say churn in customers, revenue, or in team? So obviously, you know, we're, we're always looking for great teams to back. And yep. we want to make sure that, you know, the team is solid and has worked together for a long time and has, has really gelled. So that's important. Um, but I think we focus more on revenue churn. So we want to yep. see that, the, you know, there's, there's typically like, a, we want to see that there's at least four new dollars for every dollar churned. Yep. So we look on revenue churn. I mean, customer churn is important too. It's something that we take into account. But I would say it's less important. It's okay to lose some free users if you're gaining, uh, if you're gaining paying users at the same time. Yeah. Any red flags for you? When somebody pitches you yeah. and looking for, what are some of the red flags that you see that are Im immediate turnoffs? Um, so I, I agree on the logo and revenue churn piece as far as the metrics go. Um, in terms of things that sort of strike me as a little odd in the pitch, um, when there's no product demo, um, yeah. that, that's always like a red flag that something isn't quite right. And then also I look at team composition. So if I see a SaaS company that's 50 employees, but 35 of them are sales, um, and only 10 of them are engineers, that's usually not a great sign. Um, so really interesting on uh, numbers. Do you guys get turned off by founders that don't know their numbers? I, I get worried, definitely. I think, especially in a SaaS business, SaaS is one of the most metricized, KPI uh, things you can invest in. And so I think if you're a SaaS founder, you really be, need to know your stuff, know the numbers, and or at least have someone on the team, yeah. like a CFO or a COO, that, that, that can do that. So I, I think the CEO should be able to com communicate the big, big ticket items as well. Um, they don't necessarily have to know every single detail every time, but I, I, I like detail. I think that's yeah. important. How about yourself? Yeah, most of the, the teams I meet are multi-founder teams. And so, um, you know, typically whether it's the CEO or the CTO, I, many, um, many times I'll come across someone who's very just like passionate about product and the design of the product and the customers and evangelizing the product and they're not so much a metrics person. And I think that's fine. I think it's, um, it's all about the portfolio of the founding team. And so to John's point, as long as there's someone, um, and it doesn't have to be the CEO, it can be another co-founder or, or COO, CFO, um, who knows the metrics. And, and then also, I think knowing the engagement metrics, I, I care more about that than knowing the revenue metrics, actually. Yeah. So I'm a SaaS company, and I've raised a little bit of money. I raised 500 k and I'm going for my now Series A. What mistakes have I made in the past that are prohibiting me from getting future investment? Mm -hmm. So I've raised a little bit, yeah. but I'm not raising more. Um, one thing I see, and this is getting a little into like weird fundraising dynamics, is sometimes a company will raise that first 500k from a Series A investor, yep. um, and then they'll be on the cap table for five to ten percent, or, or however much. Um, and then if I, another Series A investor, am seeing the deal, it's usually a sign that something hasn't gone quite right because um, most Series A investors are aiming to get. 20, 25% ownership. So if there's already a Series A investor on the cap table for five to 10%, it can be a negative signal. Um, so yeah. you know, to my point earlier about fundraising from stage appropriate people, um, yeah. that's much less of a risk. Okay. I, I think uh, I would say the burn. Yeah. If you're burning through cash super fast, that's uh, first of all, it's a red flag from from before in your questions, but also it's something that would really we would hesitate to look at, at putting more money into the company at that point. Yeah. You need to be efficient. Yeah. So uh, a new startup just started. They're, they're the hot thing. Are you guys looking for the next hot thing or something that's, that's like on its way up, a unicorn like overnight? Or are you guys looking for more steady, good growth? Which would you rather have, steady growth over time or this huge J-curve? 
but unexpected knowing what's going to happen in. I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. I did not ask them this before. That's well, I think, <laughs> I think price has a lot to do with it. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of times they'll be um, that hyped company, and we've seen this a lot in the news recently. Um, and, it, you know, it'll have a ton of interest. The price will get bid up. They'll have, like, a dozen term sheets. And a lot of times those companies don't turn out to be quite as good as everyone thought they were. Um, so I tend to prefer the more under the radar companies that then yeah. will hopefully get into <laughs> J yeah. curve growth. Okay. Uh, looking at the enterprise space, because a lot of those companies do big sales and they're kind of lumpy and they take a long time, we don't see a lot of super hype, massive J curve anyway. Um, but when we do, I mean, it's it's a it's obviously there's a huge hole in the market, so it's something we would absolutely look at. But price is the issue. Right, we don't want to overpay, and we want to make sure that we're also able to add value to the company. Yeah. So when, when I'm raising money with a typical venture capital firm, what kind of expected turnaround time can I expect for actually getting my money? This is something that I've had a couple people ask me that some VCs are very, very quick, some are not quick. What would you say is like expected turnaround time from pitch and setting expectations for an actual founder? Um, in terms of the norm in Silicon Valley, which is sort of its own <laughs> interesting market, I think from first pitch to final decision, um, well, so there's the one, like usually there's a one-to-one -one pitch and then there's the one-to-many or partner pitch. So from the first one-to-one -one pitch, I'd say two to three weeks is sort of the market. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen it happen as quickly as a day or two. Um, we try to get answers within two weeks, um, but yeah, it's, it's usually, and then in other markets, it's completely different. And then there's from decision to close yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually getting the money wired. So in, in the U.S. with U.S. investors, it tends to be like 30, maybe 60 days, but yeah. we've invested in a number of companies outside the U.S. and, and that tends to be, um, I mean, especially in emerging markets. 90 yeah. days longer, sometimes never, unfortunately. All right. Hey, you guys, that's all the time we have. Let's thank our panelists. Did a wonderful job. Thanks, guys. You guys thank were you. awesome. Thank you.